This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Our scriptural lesson today is coming from Psalm 105, verses 17 through 21. Notice there these words. This is speaking about Joseph, the son of Israel. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. And I want you to understand the difference in the perspective of God and the perspective of man. Man views Joseph as being sold, but God views him as being sent. God sent him. His feet they hurt with shackles. He was put in chains of iron. Until the time that his word of prophecy regarding his brothers came true, the word of the Lord tested him. It tested and refined him. The king sent and released him, the ruler of the peoples of Egypt, and set him free. And he made Joseph lord of his house and ruler of all his possessions. I'm speaking today simply from the subject tried and tested. Tried and tested. Tried and tested. It's not a matter of if you will ever be tried and tested. The, the question is, will you? When will you? It's not an if, it's a when. When? If you've not been tried or tested yet, just keep living. Just keep living. Because it's coming your way. It's coming your way. As the Lord teaches us various things, they, he uses the approach that our educational system uses today, which is spaced repetition. You teach something, you give it time to sink in, and then you, you test it. You teach and you give it time to sink in and absorb. It's spaced repetition. It's the way that we learn many of our lessons today. And that means that as, as you're taught something, you need to give it time to sink in. Uh, nobody can just be exposed to something one time and then you have it mastered. Give it time, let it sink in, and then try it again. And just remember this, that everything taught must be tested. Everything taught must be tested. You don't ever go to war with untested weapons. You don't go to war with anybody with untested weapons. Listen, the devil is too shrewd for us to go to war dealing with something demonic and you've never tested it before. When you are fighting a demon, you better go with something that's tried and tested. I mean, I'm going with the word of God. I'm going with the blood of Jesus. I, listen, I'm going with the word of my testimony. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and with the word of their testimony and by not loving their lives to death. I mean, you have to go with something that is tested and tried, tried and tested. Don't fight the devil with something that you don't know anything about it. Where you throwing some sage over your left shoulder and uh, you got some garlic hanging over your door thinking that that's going to keep demons away. Listen, the demons will take that garlic and put it on their Italian food. You better learn how to plead the blood. You better plead the blood. You better call on the name of Jesus. You better be able to employ the power of praise, the power of worship. You better be able to give your testimony. I'm telling you, don't go to war with a weapon that has not been proven. You get in a pickle, you get in a real situation, you better go with something that is tested and tried. I mean, whatever brought your grandmama and your granddaddy through, you better go, go to that. But everything that's taught must be must be tested. The things that ultimately matter in eternity are the things that actually re require time to get into us. We, we call that deep work. And that's why when people, even when they come to the altar and they repent, they have a change of mind. They have to be reoriented. 
and they have to unlearn some things and then relearn some other things. That's why you can't just come to the altar and immediately think that you've got a mature Christian. No, no, no. It's just that, that there's some things that have to be unlearned and then some things that have to be relearned. You have to be made a disciple. Nobody is born a disciple. Disciples are made. It goes through a process. The word disciple actually means learner. Learner. It means that, and, and if you're a learner, it means you've got to be taught. So disciple means learner. And we are called to be disciples. Jesus did not call us to make converts. He called us to make disciples. Go ye and make disciples of the nation, not converts. That's just the beginning. But disciples are made over time. And it, it works in the internal workings of the heart. And this is why deep internal work requires time, nurturing, and commitment. The deep works uh, that are internal, they require time, nurturing, and commitment. I love how the, the, the Apostle James, he's, he's uh, the one that I, I call like the, your common sense, no nonsense kind of apostle. And he said it in, in James chapter one, verse two through four, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. When, not if, when you fall into various trials, tests, temptations, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Faith produces patience. The testing, the testing of your faith produces patience. But let that patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. It, 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 that means mature. It takes time to mature. You cannot rush maturation. So it is the testing of your faith that produces patience. There's a connection between faith and patience. Faith and impatience do not go together. Faith and impatience do not go together. And, and remember, the Bible teaches Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6 that faith works by Love. Faith works by love. Faith works by love. When it didn't seem like my faith worked. Faith works by love. Faith works by love. And so if you're going to have your faith to work, it means that you're going to have to walk in love. And one of the great manifestations of love is that it must be accompanied by patience. I mean, 1 Corinthians 13 tells us love is patient and kind. You don't have true patience unless you're kind in the process. There are some people, I mean, they'll drop you off and wait at something, but they're blessing you out. You better not take all day. And see, that's, that's not what you call patience because real patience that comes out of a heart of love is always kind with it. The ones that suck in their teeth and roll in their eyes and, and you know, and, and it's like, it better not take all day. You better hurry up. And they're always just rushing, rushing, rushing. Uh, when you really mature in love, uh, it has a patience that is kind that goes along with it because faith and impatience do not go together. Here's what I say. Many of the tests that we experience in life are ultimately a test of our patience. And my question to you is, can you trust God and his process to develop and refine you over time? Can you trust God and can you trust his process to develop and to refine you over time? Because most of the time that you are actually being tested is not really a, a, a test of your faith as it is a test of your patience. That I've told you that the husband is coming, the wife is coming, the promotion is coming, the job is coming. I've told you that and we get impatient. It's not that our faith is, is, is challenged, our patience is tested. Have you ever worked with difficult people and you said this person is getting on my laugh nerd. They are trying my patience. They are trying my patience. It's not your faith that they are trying directly. It is more directly your patience. But faith and patience are connected because faith works by love and love is patient and kind. So you have to remember that. And whenever you see... Um, love that is patient and kind, it really ministers to you. The older that you get, the, the less you are impressed with smart people 
and the more you're impressed with kind people. People who are patient with you. Because if you go in to see a doctor, and you know, it, you can tell that the doctor is just seeing you like a piece of meat with eyes. As another patient, another uh, statistical uh, data that they have on you, where they have taken your information, and they're, they're not as conversational with you, it conveys to you that that doctor doesn't care about you if they don't take time with you to ask you questions and allow you to ask them questions. If it seems sort of rushed, as if I can just come on and get through this, you don't feel cared for, you don't feel loved. If, if a teacher is impatient with a student, if the student feels like the teacher is not taking time with them, if the coach is not taking time with the athlete, you feel like they don't care about you. It is the patience that makes you feel the love and the care. Because love is patient and kind. And even a spouse or a parent, if your spouse is always rushing you, if your spouse is unkind while they are waiting on you to get ready, to come on, and arguments break out because they are in the car waiting, and laying on the horn and screaming your name out. And it's not the kind that makes you feel the warm and fuzzies. But it's a sign of impatience. You don't feel cared for. You don't feel properly loved when there is an impatience there. And this speaks to all of it. I have to work on my patience. The word has to work on, on all of us. It, it's, it's a double-edged sword. So the same word that I'm serving to you, when I bring it to me, it cuts me as well. And I'm asking God, God help me to grow in my patience. Particularly as, as we age, we, we want to be able to be patient and kind. And I need the help of the Holy Spirit and the power of his word and revelation from him so that I can be patient and kind. Because impatience is quick to anger. Impatience is quick to give up. Impatience resents sacrifice. Impatience shifts blame. Impatience devalues and pushes people away when you're impatient. It, uh, it lacks compassion. And it is a corrupter of love whenever you are impatient. You're quick to anger. You're quick to give up. You resent sacrificing, you shift blame, you devalue people, which pushes them away, and you, you lack compassion, and it is a corrupter of actual real love. But God's patience with us is perhaps the greatest manifestation of his love for us, because he's long-suffering. You'll be out there in the world, in the clubs, smoking, doing all kinds of stuff, drinking, you know, inebriated, just stone high, thinking you're having a good time, and God is patiently waiting on you. He's just patiently waiting on you. He's not pacing the floor and using profanity. God is patiently waiting on you out of his love. It's amazing. You ought to say, Lord, I thank you for waiting on me. Thank you for putting up with my mess when I was out there wilding out, when I was clowning Jesus. I was doing stupid stuff, and you were still protecting me. You were still blessing me. You were still opening doors and presenting opportunities to me. You loved me when I didn't deserve it. You gave me things, Lord. Lord, I could have been diseased. I could have been in jail. I could have been messed up. I could have caused major accidents. But Jesus, while I was out there playing the fool, Lord, you were patiently waiting on me. Long suffering, you waited on me, Jesus. Somebody ought to thank him today for his patience, his loving kindness and his patience. I mean, he's long suffering, waiting on you to come in out of your foolishness, out of your stupidity, out of your wildness. He waited on you, waited on you. And he didn't have an attitude when you finally came. He's glad to see you coming. He's smiling. He's cheering for you. The whole host of heaven is saying, here they come. Here they come. Here they come. He said, prepare the fatted calf. Let's celebrate.
I'm thankful. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful. I'm thankful. I'm thankful. I'm thankful. See, when God, when you're walking with God, when you're walking with God, uh, uh, love moves at the pace of the slowest member of the family. Whenever you're walking with, with God, you move at, at the pace of the slowest member of the family. When you love somebody, you take time. I, I mean, I understand what it is because if, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go with somebody that you love. And so if, when you're walking, you know, I mean, if, I'm, if, I'm, if it's just me, I can just hop in the car and just go. But when my wife and I had four children under the age of five, we couldn't go real fast. And I'm like, you get those out on your side over there and I get mine out on this side. Can you imagine strapping all of these car seats in? You can't, you got to get rid of your two seater and get a, a station wagon, a minivan, a truck, an SUV to haul them around. And it takes time to get them in. It takes time to get them buckled and secured. It takes time to get them quieted and fed and, and all, it takes time. It takes time. You, you can't rush that. But love moves at the pace of the slowest member of the family so that if you're traveling with grandma and if she's on a walker, if she's on a cane, if her steps can't be as spry as yours, now you don't just leave her back there and then hollering at her, come on, grandma, I'll tell you to come on. We're going to miss the plane. We're going to miss the, come on. No, 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 love moves at the pace of the slowest member of the family. Because remember, it's like a, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. Love moves at the pace of the slowest member of the family. And so just because you're fast, when you love somebody, you slow down so you can walk with them at their pace. I can walk faster than my wife, but because I love her, I walk at her pace. So when you're called to walk with somebody, I know you'd rather just get everything just like that. But when you're walking with someone else, if you're reading, you have to read at their, at their pace. If you're eating, you have to eat at their, their pace because love moves at the pace of the slowest member of the family. And when you're family, and you wanna take the attitude that there's no child left behind, there's no adult left behind, there's no ancestor left behind, you walk at their, at their pace so that you keep the family together because it's not about the destination. Success is a journey. Learn to find joy in the journey. You ruin the whole vacation if you're just trying to get to the destination. The vacation starts the minute you get in the car. The minute your bags are packed, there ought to be a load that lets, uh, lets out of your mind and all of a sudden you ought to just start just dreaming and imagining already. Just even before you get on the train, on the plane, on the bus, in the car, on the road, you're on vacation the moment you leave home. The moment you leave and then you move at the pace of the slowest member of the family because it's not about how fast you get there. It's about being able to stop and smell the roses along the journey and to see the sight and to find joy in the simplicity of God's created beauty in the earth that is all around you. So slow down because the speed of life demands that we try to keep up, but the speed of love demands that we slow down. The speed of love demands that we slow down. The pace of life has always said, hurry, 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 come on, get that cash, stack that money, is that hurry, 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 come on, roll, make these deals happen. That's the speed of life is always rushing you. It's always making you feel like this has to happen by this time and we're under the time pressure, take it away. But when you move at the pace of love, the pace of love always says, chill out. I loved it when uh, I was growing up. I, I, I was, I'm son number four out of six. 
And I remember my oldest brother would be in there on the phone. He was a teenager, you know, I'm, I'm just, you know, he'd be in there on the phone and on the sofa, you know, where you, you had to drag the whole cord. You had that <laughs> winding cord. I know some young people don't even know what a, a house phone is. The one that has a cord and, you know, the little coils that you had to pull out. I mean, you could go about 20, 25 feet, you know, and he'd be, he'd get him a place over on the sofa, had his feet propped up and it'd be late at night and, and I'd be sometimes listening and he'd be just, they would just go minutes without saying anything. And then I would just hear him. <laughs> and I'm like, what, what is that about? They weren't saying anything. And, and these are two young folks that were in love or who thought that they were in love and they're just spending time on the phone with each other. And, and then, you know, I, I, I could tell what the woman had said on the other end of the phone because then his response was, no, you hang up first. She's like, you hang up first. No, 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 you hang up first. And they're just hanging on the phone. It's like, just hang it up. <laughs> but when you're in love, you just see the pace of love says slow your roll slow your roll slow down the pace of life is always here 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 and you know what that rapid pace does it creates stress cortisol in, in your bodies all of these stress hormones are being released and you're stressed out and love says it's gonna be all right baby just we'll get there it's okay it's okay at least we're together it's okay, at least we are together. One time my wife and I was at the airport, we was getting ready to go, we missed our flight. We, we, we just, I mean, you know, we got there 10 minutes ahead of time, they'd already closed the door. I'm, I'm like looking out the window, I'm like, the plane is still here, open the door. <laughs> but you know, we were there and so there, there happened to be a, a, a nice hotel that was right there at the airport. And uh, I just went there and checked in. Our bag's already gone. I'm looking at the bags, the bags are loaded on the plane. But we'd have to make the best of a bad situation. We checked into the hotel and had a, a second honeymoon. So it doesn't have to ruin your whole day. It doesn't have to ruin your trip, you know. Just learn how to slow down and move at the pace of love. Love demands that you slow down. Because it's, it's, it's just, it's not about what you're saying and what you're doing. It's about who you're with. It's not even about where you are. It's about who you are with. Because you can be in a beautiful place with a person with a nasty attitude. And it's like, I'll be glad when we get out of here. You know, when we get back, well, I can drop you off. And I go my way and you go. Here's what I'd say to you is that when God gives you a prophetic promise, that word will be tested. Whenever God gives you a prophetic promise, that word will be tested. Has God ever told you something and you were looking for it to happen next week? And now it's been months and it turned into years. And you're wondering, Lord, you, I mean, really? I, I, did you really mean what you said to me? When he gives you a prophetic word, that word is going to be tested. It's going to be tested. Uh, that's, that's what Psalm 105 verse 19 says. In the God's word translation, it says this, the Lord's promise tested him through fiery trials until his prediction came true. He, had, he was tested through fiery trials. That doesn't feel good. That means that was uncomfortable. It, it was an aggravating, frustrating situation. That same verse in the New Living Translation says, until the time uh, came to fulfill his dreams, the Lord tested Joseph's character. He tested his character. You see, when you're waiting on something, when you're able to be uh, patient while you have nothing, you show your character. And when you're able to be humble, when you have everything, you show your character. And so here, he says that the Lord tested Joseph's character. Not that God didn't know his character. God wanted to reveal Joseph's character to Joseph. God knows everything. 
Now, the New American Standard Version of the Bible says, until the time that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord refined him. So next time that you're waiting on the word to come true, understand that God is waiting for your character to be developed and for you to be refined. When you are being refined, it means that God is taking the unrefined parts of you out. And, and when you are polishing roughness in something, you have to use something awfully rough, not something smooth. When you want to smooth a piece of wood that is rough, you use sandpaper. So the experience that is going to come against your life is a rough, abrasive feeling experience. It doesn't feel good, but it leaves you smooth. So when God is trying to refine you as he was refining Joseph, when God was showing his character, refining his character, developing his character, Joseph went through hell and high water. You're talking about being betrayed by your blood relatives? You're talking about going to work for somebody and being betrayed by your boss lady? And then not only losing your job, but being thrown into prison and having your reputation tarnished as a result of that. I meant to be sold. His brothers profited off of him because they sold their own flesh and blood brother into slavery and made a profit off of him while he now comes into a land as a slave. But God's favor was on him. And in the whole process, God was saying, I'm testing your character. I am refining you. I am taking everything of arrogance out of you. I'm taking impatience out of you. Joseph, I'm working on you. I'm working on something in your life. It doesn't mean that it's going to be easy, Joseph and Josephine. It's going to take you some time in order to get refined. I need to smooth out your rough edges. And when you want to rush, you'll rush into a relationship with somebody that you couldn't tell how rough they were. Until you had gotten in the situation and in the relationship, you don't see those rough edges on their profile. And when you chatting in their DMs. But when you get to know them after a while and they get common with you, that's when you discover how rough they are. You thought it was sweet until you got in bed with it. So God tried Joseph as he will try you. To try means to judge the worth of. It means to purge, to purge. To purge means that you have to get some rotten stuff out of you, some toxic stuff out of you. God has to purge you. That's why he has to use fire. That's why it's not uncomfortable. Purging is not a good feeling. You eat something that's bad it's, and your stomach is torn up and you need to be purged. I mean, it's a terrible experience while it's coming out, but my God, how much better you feel after that mess that was tearing you up on the inside when he purges you of that there's a peace my God the settleness that comes as a result of that it purges it separates from impurities it develops moral character via suffering and it refines as in the work of the silversmith I love the words of C.S. Lewis that said that hardships often prepare extraordinary, uh, ordinary people for an extraordinary destiny. That's what he says. Hardships often prepare ordinary people for an extraordinary destiny. And that's why I have never seen a strong person who had an easy past. So when God really wants to develop you, he's getting ready to send some rough situations your way. But it refines you. It refines you. You'll be sweating, you're hurting, and you're going through these challenges, but it is refining something on the inside of you. And so whenever you get in a situation of testing and being tried and you cannot control your circumstances, then control your focus and control your attitude. Control your focus and control your attitude. Because... A bad attitude is just like a flat tire. You're not going anywhere until you change it. I love the words of Viktor Frankl, the, uh, the Jewish refugee in the Jewish concentration camps. Here's what he said. He said, everything can be taken from a man, but one thing, 
the last of the human freedoms to choose one's attitudes in any given set of circumstances to choose one's own way. He's in a Jewish concentration camp and watch many of his own relatives be put to death and he's sitting there waiting and he says, I'm not going to give my captors the privilege of reducing me, reducing my humanity. I get to choose my own worth, not by how you treat me. You can treat me like a dog, but I know you get to choose your own attitude amid your circumstances. And there'll be people with identical circumstances and one person is happy and the other person is upset, their lips up sticking out and they spoil their whole trip where the next person says, you know what? Yeah, they turned the power off. But baby, we having a candlelight dinner tonight. I'm gonna throw some stuff on the grill out here, baby. You just go on and just, you know, I'm gonna open up some stuff and we gonna make it do what it do. I know it's cold in here, but then you come with your blanket. <laughs> Whenever you're being tested and tried, you often feel isolated and frustrated. Yes, sir. Whenever you're being tried, because the devil starts showing you everybody else who's getting blessed. And then you'd be like, What's up with me? They're not even living anything, Lord. And now you done blessed them with a spouse. And now they, done, they got a new house. They got, they got this. They got. And you start, he starts showing you everybody else being blessed and then comes back in your trial, in your time of testing, and makes you feel like something is wrong with you. Uh, may I remind you here of the word of the Lord, Psalm 34, 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth them out of them all. Many are the affliction of the righteous, not the devils. Many of the afflictions, the tests, the temptations, the trials of righteous people, many of them, not a couple here and there, but you'll just be going through. And if you don't understand that other righteous people are going through, you'll think that it's something that you did. Lord, why is all of this happening to me? Because sister so-and-so is always blessed. Brother so-and-so is always blessed. I've never seen them with a, with a frown on their face. You don't know what they're dealing with. You're looking at an image. And now he's trying to get us to, to understand that you may be going through something and, and, and I want you to shift your perspective. I want you to understand that, that I'm refining something. I'm developing character on the inside. There's a reason that it's taken so long because if I gave this to you before you had the maturity to know how to handle the blessing, you will waste it on foolishness. You better thank God that he didn't bless you when you didn't have any sense when you were smelling yourself and you were narcissistic and thinking, I'm just telling you, the more hell that you have in you, the more narcissism, the more pride that you have in yourself, the greater your roller coaster ride is gonna be. You're gonna be on a bed of nails, you're gonna be dragged across sandpaper, but he's smoothing out your character because you've been smelling yourself and God says, I got to break you all the way down. I got to take you down to the bottom of the barrel and you'll get to know me as the God of the bottom. He's not merely the God on the mountaintop. He comes down and he will meet you at rock bottom. He'll take you down so low to the rock is the place that he begins to reveal himself as the rock of ages. When you begin to see him as the one that brings stability to your life, when you go down that you have the only place that you can look is up. But you, when you're going through a trial, when you're going through testing, you just feel like you're really honestly all by yourself. Like you're in this by yourself. And Robert Brault said that you know that you have run out of friends when it's down to nobody but you and your shadow and then you hear a voice say, you're standing in my light. He says, you know you're in a, you're in a bad situation then. Here's what I would say to you. Don't allow anger and rebellion to turn a bad moment into a bad day or worse, a bad life. Don't allow anger and rebellion. There are some people that never forgive and they develop a heart of rebellion and they turn a bad moment, a bad situation into a bad day, a bad season, 
or worse, a bad life. You don't have to let a bad moment turn into a bad life. Make the adjustments in yourself. Ask God, God, try me. Try me, Lord. And if you find, search me. If you find any wicked way in me, do whatever you need to do to expose that and cause brokenness in me. That's why God loves brokenness and contrition of heart because it's our desire to be able to get right with him. And I don't know why we assume that because we are saved that we shouldn't go through anything, that we shouldn't be tested, that we shouldn't be tried. No, 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 don't know. that's what makes you who you are. Notice 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5 through 7. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So be truly gr glad. There is wonderful joy ahead. Even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Through your faith, I mean, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. He's just telling us here. This is to show you that your faith that you have is, is, is re really real. And he says, you've got to endure. He says, you've got to endure many trials for a little while. It's just for a moment. It's just for a moment. It's a little while. So let God take you through that. And while you're in a trial, while you're in a test, you've got to learn to get God's perspective on the test. And remember, while you're on the test, you'll be seeking God and it seems like the heavens are brass to you, like you can't even get a word from him. Anybody ever felt like that? You're going through something and you can't get God to, you can't even hear him? Well, oh, maybe it's because when you're taking a test, the teacher is always silent. They're not, they're not giving you the answer during the test. But the great thing about our God is that he's made the test open book. It's an open book test. And that's why instead of standing or sitting on the premises, you need to stand on the promise. Find the promise in his word. God has already spoken his word. This is an answer book. This is a life answer book that is filled with real and practical answers for the challenges and the dilemmas of our life. It's an answer book. And he's giving you a test and it's an open book exam. God never, ever takes your word away when you're in a test. It's open book. But notice what the God perspective on the situation in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 18 and 19. He says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? Don't you see it? He said, I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. He says, forget the former things. Now, I want you to understand, uh, during this time, Israel, the Israelites were under Babylonian captivity. And they're, they're in Babylonian captivity and they can't move forward because they're, they're looking back. They're in love with what God did back in the back with what he did when he brought them out of Egypt. They're still relishing in the 10 uh, plagues that came upon the Egyptians and God parting the Red Sea and feeding them with manna and causing water to come out of a rock. They were in love with what God did back there, but that's not helping them right now. And they're still looking in, 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 in reverse in, in the rearview mirror. They're, they're driving, looking in the rearview mirror and God says, forget that, the past. He says, I'm about to do something now that will blow your mind. I'm about to bring you something now. He says, listen, it's all right you know, to glance back there and see what I did back there, but gaze up here. Keep your attention up here. Look out of the windshield, not the rear view. Look, just, just glance back and say, Lord, I thank you, but this is what you, my future is bigger than the past that, I, that we've come out of. God is exceeding greatness. He's working on something and he says, listen, I'm about to do something now that will blow your mind. He says, forget the former things. Don't dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. He says, don't you see it? 
It'll spring up. He says it's springing up now. He said, I'm in the process of it now. The seed is already in the ground and it's springing up. You've already sown the seeds for your revival. You've already sown the seeds for your harvest. It's already in the ground. He says, I'm in the midst of it right now. He says, look at what I'm getting ready to do. Look at what I'm getting ready to do. I know that you think that you're, you've had some glory days, but your best days are in, ahead of you. You know why? It is because Jesus saves the best wine for last. It's because you're in your fourth quarter where you got more wisdom, you've made more mistakes, you've had more experience, you've got more pers perspective, you've got more compassion, you've got more empathy, empathy, you understand things more now, you've got more grace, you've got more patience, you've got now more of a mindset to know what to do with money. He said, I've been saving this. I'm getting ready to give you your best wine now. He said, you're in your fourth quarter now. And that's where the games are won, in the fourth quarter. You don't win the game at halftime. You win the game in the fourth quarter. And God is getting ready. I'm just telling you, I know he's blessed you in the past. I know he delivered you in the past. I know he healed you in the past. But God said, listen, I got new testimony. I'm getting ready to heal you again. I'm getting ready to deliver you on another level again. I'm getting ready to cause divine, divine hookups, divine hookups. I'm getting ready to bring your partners in this time. You tried to do it by yourself, but this time, this time, this time, I'm doing the network. I'm going to cause water to spring up in a dry place. I'm getting ready. God's working on something. This is your season. This is God reminding us, watch what I do next. Watch what I do next. Watch, watch, he said, put your eyes on me. Watch what I do. I don't know about you, but I just believe that the best is yet to come. I just believe the best is yet to come. Lo mejor está por venir. It is the best is yet. Can I give you another prophetic word? The promise of God is more powerful than your current problem. The promise of God is more powerful than your current problem. I said the promise of God is more powerful than your current problem. God is greater. God is greater. He says fix your face. Face forward, face forward, face forward, face forward because the promises of God that are there waiting on you is greater than the current problem and situation that you're in right now. I came to remind you today that you can always rely on God's word. Always. Psalm 1830 says, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. It is proven. Uh, it, that word literally means it is refined. It is a proven word. It's a refined word. And he is a shield to all who trust in him. He said in Psalm chapter 12 and verse 6, that the words of the Lord are pure words, like silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. It's tried. It's tested and tried. Tried and tested. And you can trust God whenever he speaks. He declared to us in Numbers chapter 23 and verse 19, God is not a man, so he does not lie. He's not human, so he does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? He says, you can take my word to the bank. You can depend upon me. You can depend upon me. I'm telling you, if you'll walk with him faithfully through the trial. 
Joseph was not the first person to be tried by God. God tried a whole nation of people in Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 2 and 3. He says, remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness all these 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would obey his commands. Yes, he humbled you by letting you go hungry. Anybody ever had to go hungry? And then by feeding you with manna, you couldn't even figure out how in the world, based on your little salary, you were able to eat and educate your children. You don't even understand how you were able to keep a roof over your head and the utilities turned on. But he said, I fed you with manna. You didn't even understand it. A food that was previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone, but rather we live by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And I've come to remind you of this truth that you cannot go around what God has destined you to go through. You cannot go around what God has destined you to go through. You cannot go around what God has destined you to go through. The Apostle Paul spoke to young Timothy and said, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. He didn't say pray to be delivered out of this because your development is in it. You've got to go through it. There's some things that you've got to go through. Walk with God, hold on to his hands, trust in his word and walk through it. You walk through the storm. You walk through the rain. You walk through the pain. You walk through sickness. You walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Yea, though I walk, your way out is through. Your way out is. Tell somebody, walk through it, walk through it, walk through it. Pray through it. Praise through it. Go through it. Go through the gates. Go through the gates. Go through the gates. Something else that I've discovered that when people, when you've, when you've done the best that you can, helping other people, and then you're in trouble, and you feel like you don't have anybody to help you. You've been so kind, you've helped other people, you've volunteered for other people, you've given to other people, and then you give out, and then the very people that you've helped, they can't reciprocate it. But here's what the Lord says to you in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 10 through 12, for God is not unjust. God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints. And you still do. Still got a serving heart. Still have a, a, a heart of hospitality. And we desire each one of you that you show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope unto the end so that you might not be sluggish but imitators, followers of those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. You inherit the promises of God through faith and patience. You inherit the promises of God through faith and patience. You inherit the promises of God through faith and patience. I want to give you a few keys and then we're finished. Keys to enduring while being test, tried and tested. Keys to enduring while being tried and tested. Number one, keep praying. Just keep praying. First Thessalonians 5, 17 says, never stop praying. Never stop praying. Never stop praying. Just keep on praying. Keep on praying. Keep on praying. And I've had some people to say to me, well, Bishop, I've been praying about this thing and it's like it's not going to ever happen. This God is not going to do. I would say to them, make sure that you're asking this thing according to the will of God because 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15, notice this. This is a confidence that we have uh, in, in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. If we ask anything according to his will, not the lust of your flesh, not your greed, not your pride. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of him. And may I just tell you, this is sometimes the great temptation when you're going through a trial is to quit praying. But I want you to remember the word of the Lord in 2 Kings chapter 18, when the prophet Elijah was there and he spoke to his servant. He told Ahab, listen, it's going to rain. He told the king, rain is getting ready to come. He said, you better prepare your chariot because the rain is coming. He gave, he stood on a prophetic word and nothing was happening. He had to tell his servant, go there and check and see whether there's, he sent him down toward the sea to see whether there was anything that looked like rain was coming because he was hearing something, but he wasn't seeing anything. 
And so he said to his servant, go there and check. He came back, he said, I don't see anything. He, 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 and he came back a second time. Go back and check it again. I know what God said. Go back and check it again. I don't see anything. But go back and check it again. He sent him back a third time. I don't see anything. He said, go back and check it again. Send him a fourth time. I don't see anything. He sent him back again. Go back again. A fifth time. I don't see anything. By this time, the Bible said the prophet Elijah bowed his head between his knees. He's getting in the birthing position. He's saying, I know it's in me. I know he gave me the word. The same way that Mary carried the word and gave birth to it. The same way that she delivered the word and then the word delivered her. My God, you carry something on the inside of you that if you can ever put your head down between your knees and get into the birthing position, if you'll do it like Elijah did it, Elijah put his head between his knees and began to cry out under God, sent him back a sixth time. And he came back and said this time, hey, 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 look like I'm seeing something. It was a cloud that was the size of a man's hand. And at the seventh time, my God, my God, you got to pray perfectly until God has, until you have travailed with what he's shown you on the inside. Travail with the word. It, it doesn't come overnight, it comes over time. And you got to be able to go through faith and patience and birth your prophetic promise. While the, Peter was in jail and they'd been killing some of the other apostles, and Peter's life was threatened that they were going to kill him. But the Bible says that when they, the church heard it, the church, the whole church went into prayer for Peter. And, and while Peter was in prison, Acts chapter 12 and verse 5, the church prayed very earnestly for him. While they are praying, Peter comes and knocks on the door. They couldn't believe that God had answered their prayer. But God sent an angel into the prison, unlocked Peter's shackles, opened the prison door and brought him out miraculously. I'm here to tell you that there's something that he'll do with a lawyer, but sometimes God says, you know what? The corrupt systems of mankind, I need to bring my sovereign grace into this. That when God has birthed something, you can, your legislation cannot really stop it. Because just because something is legal does not mean it's moral. It doesn't mean that it is right. And God is saying, listen, I've got a, I got a prophet. I got a prophet that's there. I got a wild man that's in prison and I'm gonna send my agent to get him out. I'm not gonna waste time and money on an attorney because the system is corrupt. He says, I got a way to be able to get him out and he came and knocked on the door. I'm here to tell you that when you can't see any other way, just understand that God is a God of miracles. And there are angels on assignment in the earth. They are the agents of God, the secret agents of the Lord to do the bidding of the Father. When you're going through testing, you gotta be you gotta strengthen and encourage yourself in the Lord. That's what David did in 2 Samuel chapter 30 and verse 6. David was greatly distressed for the men spoke of stone in him because of the souls of, of them that were bitterly grieved and each man for his sons and daughters. But David encouraged and strengthened himself in the Lord his God. He had to remind himself that every time I've been in trouble, God delivered me. Every time I was sick, God healed me. Every time I was locked in, God brought me out. He strengthened himself in the testimonies of what God had already done. What has he already done for you? Didn't he send the money the last time? Didn't he allow you to be able to get through it? Didn't he make a way for you to do it without your losing your mind? Didn't, didn't God, didn't God, didn't God? Write the vision and go back and read it again. Read it, read it, read it, read it. He strengthened himself. You'll get in a low place and there's nobody else to encourage you. The Bible said he encouraged himself. There was no preacher. There was no Sunday school teacher. There was no deacon that came to him. He encouraged himself. The whole world was against him. But he encouraged himself, reminding him of God's promises concerning him. And then when you're in your trying time, the third strategy is to do what you know to do. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 9 puts it this way. Keep putting into practice all that you've learned and received from me. Just keep doing what you know to do. 
keep putting into practice all that you've learned and received from me, everything that you heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. I'm going to bring peace into your life, but just keep doing what you know. In other words, he was saying, walk in the light that you already have. Do what you know to do. If you get in a situation, you know prayer is right, do that. You know serving other people is right, do that. You know being faithful in your tithes is right, do that. He says, walk in the light that you've already got. Keep serving others, even though you need to be served. Heal others, even though you're sick, even though you're hurting. Comfort others. You do that. And God says, your, your, your deeds will not go. You will discover that there is a seed in every deed. A seed in every deed. There is a seed in every deed. Sow your way out. Shekarati Mohosa. Sow your way out. There is a seed in every deed, good or bad. Sow your way out. Sow your way out. Sow your way out. The fourth strategy is to get in the company of those who comfort and strengthen you. And the apostle was released Peter and John from prison after they had been beaten. The Bible says as soon as they were freed, Acts 4.23, Peter and John returned to the other believers. The Bible says in King James Version, they went to their own company. The other believers, the folks who were able to encourage them and told them what the leading priests and elders had said. They comforted him. They, they consoled him. They fortified him. And here's the fifth thing. Remind yourself that this too shall pass. While you're in your pickle, you're going through, this too shall pass. Sometimes that's the best thing that you can do when you're going through a d deep trial. You're suffering, you're hurting, you're in depression, you're in financial straits. This too shall pass. Remind yourself of that. Is that scripture? Well, here's the scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 and 18. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. They're small, the present troubles, they're small and they won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles that we can uh, see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen for the things that we see now will soon be gone and the things that we cannot see will last forever. There are some of you who are in a dark night. And may I just say that sometimes when you're in deep pain, in deep isolation, in deep depression, you're just asking God for enough strength to get through the sharpness of the pain that you're experiencing. If you got shallowness of breath, it's like, Lord Jesus, I, it's not about tomorrow, Lord, just help me to get through the next five minutes. Help me to get through this next contraction. Just help me, Jesus. Help me, the, the next hour, just Jesus, help me. You gotta have faith just for the next 10 minutes. Faith to be able to get through the test. Faith to get through the trial. Faith to just sometimes get through the night. A lot of you just make, if I can get to the daylight. Help me to get through this tonight. If I can just get through this, this too shall pass. This too shall pass. This too shall pass. This too shall pass. Where it looks like Nobody will hire you. This too shall, shall pass. This too shall pass. It look like these children will never grow up. This too shall pass. It look like this foolishness that I'm dealing with in my relationship. This too shall pass. Still living from hand to mouth. This too shall pass. The craziness in the family. This too shall pass. Is letting us know that trouble does not last always that very trial that is trying your soul the thing that interrupts your sleep the thing that while you're at work and all of a sudden your thoughts get pulled back into this abyss you get pulled back down into the lowness and you start overthinking and the devil is wearing you out and you're tired because you have been entertaining toxic thoughts that are demonic to make you assume that the worst is going to happen. But God, ye poor old My God, my God. 
I'm just here to tell you today. God says, listen, I want you to have real faith and patience along with it. Yeah, you've had, you've had faith, but patience. Remember the promises. You inherit the promise through faith and patience. It's not faith or patience. Faith and patience. That means that this thing is going to take, it's going to take time. And I know it's been a long night. But you watch God do a quick work. When he went in and got Peter out, he went in while they were praying and got him out. He got him out. He dropped the charges. God has a way of getting you out and keeping you out. Where the results of the grace of his spirit become eternal. He's working a work of eternality. I've never seen a strong person with an easy pass. And people who are passionate about God have been through hell and high water because they've been passionate about the devil and his stuff too. And when God does something in your life, my, my, he never takes that fire away. He redirects the fire. She God's purpose I want you to focus forward because God says I got something I got something for you that eyes have not seen ears have not heard neither has it even entered into the heart God says I got a plan for you it's not in vain it's not in vain and while you're just waiting you didn't realize that you are being smoothed in the rough places where your tongue was cutting people off and offending people and you were ungraceful. God says, I'm smoothing you out now. I'm making you empathetic and compassionate toward the lives of others. You didn't understand. You treated other people like dogs until you start to feel like a dog yourself. And now I give you an, an ability to be able to relate and to understand the very people that you've been making fun of and, 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 uh, and jiving with and, and, and bringing down. Now, now you understand now their pain. So that when I bring you out, this time there's such a refineness that has come to you. You've got a grace in your heart to be able to love people in a love that is not feigned, but a love that is genuine. And God says, I'm bringing, I'm bringing you out of this time with eyes to be able to recognize now the pain that's in the eyes of other people that's been in the same pain that God will have delivered you from. And now he'll send you as a divine ambassador in with the keys to be able to unlock them from their prison cells because God showed you the way out. Now he's using you to show others out and that you disciple them. <laughs> tested and tried, tried and tested. This is a critical time of the Holy Spirit. These are trying times in finances, in health, in education, in politics. I am here to tell you, she crashed him on such. And we are coming into a time and season now with incredible sociological change, technological change, environmental change, economic change, political change. And the glory of God is looking for ambassadors to go into each one of these areas and be the change exemplifying the character of Christ as he has refined us so that he pulls self out of self until self dies so the purposes of Jesus Christ can live in you and through you this time you're not living for yourself this time you're living for him he saved you on purpose with purpose and for purpose you belong to him and the agenda of God is going to be done in the earth. I'm excited about these times. I know prices are going up and opportunities are going down, but God is God. He's still on the throne. And I don't care how good you've had it, God says face forward because the best is yet to come. Some glorious things are coming your way as we will set our hearts and our attitudes to say, Lord, I'm going to trust you and I will wait patiently on you and I'll be kind while I'm waiting and watch 
what you do next. Lord, our eyes are upon you. I pray you got something out of God's word today. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.